Welcome to Newbie Introduction to Espresso. Uh, my name is Dan Keen, and with me is uh, Philip Marquis, our volunteer newbie. Hello. And uh, this time, we've, we were talking a lot about what we're going to do for this, and we had promised in previous videos that we were going to cover problem diagnosis. And in preparation for that, I was talking to Lem Butler. He's a trainer at uh, Counterculture. And he's, with his training, I was asking, what are the sort of problems that you people or your, your trainees are often running across? And invariably, he said, the most important thing is consistency. Consistency is really key. Mm -hmm. It is trying to establish a routine. And so instead of doing a video on problem diagnosis, we're going to look at it as kind of a glass half full problem instead of half empty and say, we're going to look at consistency. So that's going to be our theme uh, for today is consistency. And consistency is really comes down to the four elements that are any barista has to master. There's the espresso machine, the grinder, mm -hmm. the coffee, and then of course their own their own contribution, uh, their technique. So I'm going to briefly cover what you can do in each one of those elements to help with consistency, and then we're going to do a couple exercises. We're going to demonstrate that. Cool. Okay. Awesome. So first starting out with you know, the espresso machine is that each espresso machine has its own little quirks that you have to deal with for temperature management. But generally speaking, there's some things you have to keep in mind. It is the capability of a given espresso machine, you have to adapt your technique to it. So this is a, a full-on commercial espresso machine and it is much more tolerant of you know, barista errors. So if you flush too much or you run it too fast, it doesn't really matter. It will deal with that quite nicely. But as you get into the smaller espresso machines that you see in a home, they're much more sensitive to that sort of thing. Mm. So you have to pay attention to you know, do you, how often do you flush, how much do you flush, how mm -hmm. fast do you go. Those are all things you have to consider. Mm -hmm. And in the next video, right at it, the next one in this series, we're going to talk a bit more about these different classes of espresso machines. Mm -hmm. But the important thing is, is you have to adapt your, your, your pace, your flushing mm -hmm. routine, etc. To match the equipment and most importantly is you have to be consistent in doing that you want to ask a question yeah newbie question sure terminology flushing right <laughs> <laughs> okay that's fine that's cool um, when you have to when you start an extraction yeah. you first want to warm the group head typically okay. right and so you have to run some of the water through the group head to bring it up to temperature now okay. that routine that you use sometimes you do it simply to clear away the old coffee Okay. Other times you need to explicitly flush water through the group head to stabilize and equalize the temperature. Okay. Now you see, depending on what kind of espresso I was machine say, you have, is that on all machines or maybe just more the higher end commercial type? Or? Actually, it's just the opposite. Oh, okay. Is that the the higher you go up on the food chain, the less sensitive okay. they become to these flushing routines. Okay. You see, and so we're going to cover that as we yeah. go through this routine. But you know, that's okay. a good question. Okay. Thank you. The next one is, is that the, next to the espresso machine is the grinder. And with the grinder, you really have to consider uh, your contribution to for really for correcting in some regards uh, grinder deficiencies. I mean, that's, that's mm -hmm. a little harsh, but I'm going to say that, that's a fair assessment is, is mm -hmm. that a lot of times when you're using a grinder, especially the lower end ones, um, they might not necessarily uh, distribute the coffee very evenly. Right. And so when it lands in the porta filter, it doesn't just, you know, if you just let it just pour in naturally, mm -hmm. it, it may have clumping, it may come out, you know, in kind of spurts and stuff like that. So subsequently as the barista, you have to, you know, massage a bit to mm -hmm. kind of groom those coffee grounds to even out some of the grinder inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. But there are some other things though that, you know, that don't have as much to do with grinder design, but has to do with usage patterns. Okay. So if you change the grind setting, mm -hmm. you have to remember, purge the old grinds out of the grinder because otherwise you're gonna have a mix of the previous grind setting and the new grind setting. And mm -hmm. people, especially newbies, are so reluctant to waste coffee. Mm -hmm. right? I paid $16 a pound Absolutely. for this coffee. I don't wanna waste it. Use every drop. Well, but the yeah. problem is, is that, is that by skipping some of these steps, you may save some coffee but the result will be less optimal. Sure. And so in some respects, you're wasting coffee right. by your unwillingness, by being miserly with coffee. Especially when you're starting out, don't be afraid to waste coffee because it's better to use fresh, 
quality coffee and learn how to use that. Mm -hmm. Because if you used, you know, a uh, poor quality coffee or heaven forbid, a stale coffee, mm -hmm. it's much harder to dial in coffees that are post roast or that are, have a long post roast state, you know, that have been mm -hmm. sitting on the shelf for a month. Their margin of error is super tiny. Gotcha. Subsequently, you know, don't hesitate to, you know, order good coffees and treat it as part of an expense of learning. That's just kind of the way it is. Gotcha. So that's kind of, you know, the grinder and what the barista could do to, you know, ensure a certain amount of consistency. And then, of course, the most important thing they can do is, is be willing to get, you know, fresh, uh, well-known coffee. Mm -hmm. A lot, especially when you're a newbie, I always recommend, uh, you know, pick things that you read about a lot in the forums. You know, mm -hmm. choose a coffee from a known uh, popular brand. Mm -hmm. So that way you'll have an idea of what to expect. Mm -hmm. Go so ahead. quick question. So you, you've been giving me some coffee to use. Mm -hmm. um, this last time I actually went out to the local Whole Foods. Sorry to drop names. Um, and I got the exact same coffee oh, that yeah. you've been giving me. Sure. I'm assuming I didn't check package dates or anything mm -hmm. like that. There's probably a difference there now that I hear you say that. Yeah, unfortunately there is. Okay. Um, when you order online directly from the roaster, okay. practically every roaster ships the same day, sometimes the next day absolute latest. That's roast. Wow. Correct. Okay. Normally it's the same day. Okay. So they roast in the morning, they ship in the afternoon. Okay. That's typically the case. When you buy it on the shelf, you know, the grocer has their own priorities. Yeah. Um, if they're getting a lot of turnover, mm -hmm. it's possible that coffee may only be a week or so old. Yeah. Right? It's possible. Mm -hmm. But it's not unusual for it to be 30, 60, even 90 days old. Wow. And you see, and some people think, you know, oh, well, it's inside of a bag. That doesn't matter. It's sealed, right? Well, you know, it's kind of <laughs> like saying, you know, bread in a plastic bag will stay fresh. Yeah. Fresher longer yeah. than, than bread that's, you know, in a paper bag, right? Yeah. So it does slow the staling process, but yeah. it certainly does not stop it. Okay. And so subsequently, you probably had more trouble dialing it in, I bet. That's, that's what I t t just told you. I had a huge amount of trouble this past week. Yeah. And now I'm starting to think about it. The only thing that's changed is the coffee. Yeah. So. Which goes to show, it's, it's ironic, is that many times when people go you know, shopping for equipment, they think of, you know, the espresso machine is most yeah. important and the grinder, well, you know, it just, it just makes powder, right? Mm -hmm. The irony is, is it's just the opposite. The coffee is by far the most important selection. The other contributions, really, you're only taken away from their potential. Mm -hmm. In some respects, you could think of as coffee has a maximum potential, mm -hmm. then every step along the way, it potentially loses some of that, gotcha. right? So when you uh, choose a grinder or espresso machine or technique, mm -hmm. your goal is to do as little damage as possible. I mean, in some regards, that's kind of what it is, right? And so, you know, the coffee, number one important thing. Don't, you know, don't cheap out there. Mm -hmm. That's the... And the grinder is a lot of times people think that that's just, you know, a powder maker. Right. But in fact, you know, the grinder really its consistency. And that's what this theme is about. It's consistency is most important. And the good news is, is that the good news is, uh, one second here. A lot of times what people think is the grinder just, you know, makes powder and that's all that really matters. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it's consistency is the top contributor to the end result. Yeah, I know it's not as sexy. People think of espresso machines. They see a lot of chrome and you know all that. Yeah. And that's kind of the star of the show. But really, it's, it's lower in priority than the grinder. And then really what brings it all together mm -hmm. is, is you, you know, mm -hmm. the barista. By choosing equipment and using it properly, you are the final gateway to what the end result is. So you know, think about when you're using a grinder, some of those consistency uh, notes mm -hmm. we talked about. Uh, with espresso machines, paying attention to the, the flushing routine they use. And we're going to go over that in just a minute. Okay. And then with the coffee, again, don't cheap out. You know, mm -hmm. Fresh coffee is really what assures consistency. So with that, now let's go ahead and demonstrate some techniques. Now, in the previous videos, I kind of gave you a, a newbie routine that was mm -hmm. about, you know, we would weigh each basket, mm -hmm. we verifies within, you know, a tenth of a gram. Mm -hmm. That's always good advice. That is definitely going to be uh, good for consistency. But as you know, lately uh, I've been working at some catering events. Mm -hmm. And uh, subsequently, instead of having you know, just myself to serve or me and, and, and a guest, 
you know, I'd have 20, 25 people uh, waiting uh, mm -hmm. for an espresso or cappuccino latte. And I learned a lot more about speed and flow and consistency, kind of our theme here. Right. And so for this one is we're going to step you a little bit out of your comfort zone. We're going we're to try a different technique that isn't so newbie centric, that is more towards consistency, but also a lot more about speed. Okay. Right? So that's going to be our technique. And, and again, consistency is the same thing. Do the same thing every time. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do basically three different approaches. They're all going to be a, what's called a strike-off approach. Okay. You know, when you did before is you took the um, basket out of the port filter, put it on a scale, and dosed into that, right? right? This time, we're going to keep everything just normal. We're not going to work straight from the port filter. But that means then we have to have a different way of, or a, a faster way okay. of doing that. So that's why I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate. First, okay. we're going to do a simple strike off method. Okay. And then I'm going to show up dosing, down dosing, and then we'll do a bottomless pours and then wrap up. Cool. So let's start with that. Remember we were talking about consistency, right? Mm -hmm. One thing is, is that, you know, here, I just did a quick flush and I also scrubbed this uh, dispersion screen. I did that just as, for demonstration purposes, but normally I would do that little flush right before to knock off any coffee or something like that. And also the dispersion screen, since it's nice and clean, you see how it falls so nice and evenly? Yep. So that's a little trick that will help you get more consistency is make sure the dispersion screen is nice and clean before each shot so you get a more even dispersion of, this, of the water before pressurization. Okay. Now, so the machine I was using, you it, there's no lever. You press the button, right, and it goes. Now, should I then wait? There, there, it seems like there's a stage in that machine where it'll start to come out, and you right. can pressurize, and then it pours out. The one that you had had built-in pre-infusion. That's okay. what you're talking about. And you know, you bring up a valid point here. I don't have to worry too much about when I flush or when I don't flush because it will tolerate you know short yeah. flushes without any temperature issues. With the smaller ones like what you have, yeah. you should definitely flush at the end of each extraction. Okay. So you flush a little bit to clean the screen, give it right. a quick scrub. So that way, by the time you repair the next extraction, ah, the boiler has time to, to heat back up and to restabilize. Okay. It's not just about the boiler. The boiler catches up in like 15 seconds. Okay. But by the time the rest of the group, it has to essentially kind of let that heat pass from the boiler to the group head to where it's already at one temperature. See. Gotcha. So let's go ahead and, and demonstrate the uh, strike off method. Now, I did that just as a, a quick, I had some old coffee in there when I was preparing a different session. I went ahead and purged that. Okay. Now you see, you see right here, I went over top a little bit, right. right? And you can either use an implement like this, and you can just simply go and strike off an even amount. Okay. Okay, so that's the first strike off technique. But let's say that gives you a dose typically of about uh, 14 to 16 grams to paint on the basket. And you can order different basket depths to get different doses. So that's what we call a neutral dose. Okay. Okay. But say you want to up dose. And remember, we want to increase the dose a little bit. Mm -hmm. If you want to increase the dose, and you want to guess why you might do that from your previous experience? I was hoping you weren't going to ask me that. <laughs> <It's there. laughs> if you want to up dose, remember we talked about like as coffee scales or something like that, or if you want to punch it up a little bit, uh -huh. you want to increase the amount of coffee extraction, uh -huh. especially if the coffee starts to fade, okay. you might increase the dose, right? Yeah. Well, that would give you a reason where like if this was an absolute fresh coffee, you might strike straight across. I see. But as you, as the coffee starts to age, it gets into week one, week sure. you now the it eight day. some of its oils. Correct, yep. exactly. What you can do is, is that you can increase the dose. And I'll show you how to do that. So that was a nice straight level cut. Okay. All you do is you give it a little tap like that. And then it comes. And you see how it settles down about it just a little, and then just redose again. Okay. And maybe a little tap more. Now I'm going to go over a little over the top just for demonstration purposes. You see? So now I've increased the dose. That typically, you know, each tap buys about a gram. Sure. So like if you had, that would be an up dose of, of about two grams. Okay. Now with practice, you'll find that you'll be really pretty darn precise. The goal is to be 
uh, within about 0.3 grams. Okay. You know, it's not as precise as getting out of scale and sure. measuring a basket and all that. You know, that's true. But one thing I learned from that uh, catering experience is I originally went out the first time with a scale. <laughs> After about five minutes, like, no, this ain't going to work, <laughs> you know, because I was falling behind so yeah. much trying to, you know, re-tear the scale, wait for it to, you know, it was, it was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Within about five minutes, I said, I'll never keep up. Yeah. And then after having done those catering gigs two or three times, mm -hmm. I said, you know, I was, I'm starting to like this method. You know, it was a lot faster. And so I just said, I'm going to do a nice neutral thing. And so that's what we're going to do here. Cool. So it's, and that's updosing. Okay. Now, of course, the opposite is downdosing. Okay. With down dosing, there you have a different reason for doing it. It might be the basket's neutral dose is, say, 16 grams. Mm -hmm. And you want to reduce the dose. Why you might do that is, is that as you get a lower dose, it tends to uh, pour a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. And it might bring out more you know, fruit flavors, stuff like that. In other words, instead of it being amped up, it kind of amps it down. And then other lesser uh, fruit notes mm -hmm. or, or taste notes... Can come to the forefront mm -hmm. so that's typically why people down dose okay so it can be and there's a couple ways you can do it you know we've already done this one but let's go ahead and, and demonstrate that is one way is you kind of do a cup sort of approach like mm -hmm. that sort of arching your finger in. just arching the finger in the other way is some people if you want to even that out you kind of follow along the rim like that mm -hmm. until you you end up with a little bit of a divot in the middle that's kind of hard to avoid if you mm -hmm. want to you can try and eliminate that or another approach that people use from time to time is actually, this is the cheater's method. Let's go like that. Oh, the time, yeah. You just take a plate or similar sort of implement and just run it across the, the top. And now you see you've knocked off maybe about a gram and a half, two dose, mm -hmm. so, or two grams. So, you know, a little bit of a down dose. Thing. So that, that was kind of a, is for review. We're doing strike off, which is a neutral. And I know that some people are gonna say, hey, you're wasting all that coffee. Well, keep in mind, I was always striking off into the doser. Yeah. And so, you know, it's true that if you were doing just one espresso, you know, it's going to increase your, your waste. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing four, five, six espressos, uh, which any, you know, mm -hmm. any home barista does, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? I mean, I joke, but you know, there's some truth to it is that, yeah. you know, I always like to do three or four uh -huh. where, you know, the first two or so are for, for taste, yeah. you know, kind of dial in. And the last two were really for pleasure. Yeah. So, you know, get used yeah. to doing that. I mean, you go through more coffee, but you know, that's, that's kind of the fun of it. Sure. Right? Sure. So, you know, to review, we had neutral dose, mm -hmm. up dose, tap, tap, uh, down dose, scrape across. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're going to do in the next segment. All right. Okay. So um, let's go ahead. Before we do that, though, we have one last topic that we're going to demonstrate in that next segment is covering the bottomless porta filter. Okay. Now, I think you've already had one, right? Yep. Yeah. I've never used anything other, actually. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's cool. I don't know if you've been using it much for diagnostic purposes. I, mean, I watch it. I don't really... I think I know what I'm looking at, but... Right. Well, that's fine with this purpose is that we're going to show, you know, a correct extraction. Okay. And I'm going to get a second camera and we're going to get a close-up of it. Okay. I'm going to show a correct extraction and then I'm going to show a not so correct extraction great. and then we're gonna let you take over and see what happens and you know if it goes great that's fine you know, if you do have a problem we're gonna say what happened but what you can use a bottomless portafilter for is really a diagnosing whether the extraction is even and consistent mm -hmm. that's really what it's about okay. and so the goal is to be able to see across the whole bottom of the basket Mm -hmm. The goal is to see that it initially beads all at the same time. It sort of comes together eventually. Well, a lot of people, they focus on that cone, okay. right? Because they want to take pictures of that, for yeah. example. You know, it's kind of like, you know, some, I don't yeah. know. It's, 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 it's some sort of fascination with yeah. espresso aficionados at home is they want to be able to post pictures of their beautiful extraction. But the fact of the matter is the most information comes from the very first two or three seconds okay is that you know does it uh bead all the way across the uh, okay. surface okay a lot of times it'll do is it'll first bead along the outside perimeter what we call a donut extraction mm -hmm. and if you look at the donut extraction what'll happen is is it'll bead across the outer the, the, the become like a dead center yeah. right and the dead center will then be covered up by that cone uh -huh. And so to appear as it looks like all is well and good, right? But none of that coffee is getting pushed through. Exactly. It's all just coming from the edges. And, Correct. Yeah. And that means it'll blonde more quickly mm -hmm. because you're extracting really just from a portion of the mm -hmm. puck, right? So that's an example of, of one sort of 
one that newbies run across a lot, like people join the forums, they have questions. It's not so much donut extractions, it's typically you know the more extremes. Mm. Uh, the gushers, you've probably seen one or two of those, right? Uh, quite, quite a few. <laughs> right. So a gusher is when uh, it rapidly fills out and then the cone comes out very large. Yeah. Usually within 10 or 15 seconds, it's blonde as yeah. can be, yeah. and then it gets really bad from there, right? Correct. Uh, what's the typical cause you want to make a shot of that? Um, I would say either the coffee is not fine enough mm -hmm. or it's stale. Ah, number one correct answer is stale. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when newbies join, remember we warned them about <laughs> using stale coffee, right? And they're like, oh, you know, and they think, well, maybe if I grind finer, yeah. right? That, that's, man, this is so refreshing to hear because remember before we started, I was telling you I've really been struggling the past week and it's because I bought that other coffee. I didn't use that. And I mean, I had it cranked down to the finest setting and it's still just gushing out. And I was like, what am I doing? Is it too fine? You know, yeah, I'm not packing it down. Right. Then I started increasing the dosage and playing around. Nothing I could do. Anyways, I digress. No, no, you're, you're no, you. that's, it's, it's exactly right. I'm, I'm glad you, I'm, I want to say, I'm glad you had that experience, yeah. but yeah. it's an experience that many new home baristas experience. And, you know, really the answer is, is no the roast date of your coffee. Yeah. Most coffees hit their prime uh, somewhere between days four and seven. Uh, they're still, most are usually quite good, mm -hmm. even at day 10. Mm -hmm. um, most start to kind of drop off. Some coffees drop off very precipitously, mm. uh, especially uh, like if you have a very floral, rich sort of uh, single espresso, mm -hmm. they tend to have a narrower window. Okay. Where you know commercial blends that are used in a bar, mm -hmm. those are kind of optimized to have a more forgiving edge to it. And so they'll start to fade, but they'll fade gently over those days. And now can you slow the process down by like what you suggest, putting them in mason jars and in the freezer? That's an excellent idea. And, and this timing you're talking about, is this just leaving the coffee out or is that sealed or is it really those variables don't really It's a good question. So I mean, uh, people are reluctant sometimes to get fresh coffee because they're like, well, it costs a lot for shipping yeah. and you know, I don't want to order two pounds or three pounds and have it just waste. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a good way of dealing with that problem is the freezer uh, does, slows down the staling process dramatically, especially if you have a chest freezer, a mm -hmm. deep freezer that almost stops it. Mm -hmm. So if you want to order two or three pounds of coffee, which might take you a month, month and a half to go through, mm -hmm. it's perfectly legitimate to, you know, order those three pounds, break them up into mason jars, okay? Mm -hmm. Eliminate, doses. right, deliver and get rid of all the air as mm -hmm. much as you can, mm -hmm. cap them real tight. Put them in the freezer, mm -hmm. and you know we've done taste comparisons. Uh, you know, no one would claim if it's done properly. You know, four to six weeks, it'll be just like it came from the mm -hmm. roaster. You see, wow. so that way, you know, you're always dealing with. You're not having to constantly redial in your coffee. Yeah. Because if you, what I would do is, is get a mason jar that's enough to go for maybe you know half a week. Yeah. So that way, you're always you can just increase the dose a little teeny bit as yeah. you get to day four, day five, yeah. and then when you get your new coffee from yeah. the freezer, yeah. uh, you just do that again, and you yeah. don't even have to change your grind setting. You could just you know, now you go back to the dose, and you can go straight from the freezer to the grinder. Well, you know there are some purists who feel that you might get condensation on that, and okay. that could be detrimental. Uh, I personally just have enough that uh, I take it out, you know, for a few hours. It's okay. More than fine. Okay. And just enough for a couple days is what yeah. I recommend. Okay. You know, so that way if you get a coffee that, you know, you order it, um, you have it, you know, it's probably rested for say three or four days. Mm -hmm. By the time you, you put it in the freezer right away, when you pull it back out, it's already going to have stale a little bit. Mm -hmm. So it might have picked up a day or two, mm -hmm. relatively mm -hmm. speaking, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll be like you'll be starting over all anew. Okay. And then you got fresh coffee the entire month. Perfect. So that's, that's, there's really no excuse for not having fresh coffee. Awesome. So that explains gushers. Okay. Now we're going to go the opposite extreme. Uh, you go to your really uh, stale coffee that you inadvertently bought, uh -huh. and then uh, you get some fresh coffee from your buddy Dan, okay. and you forget to change the grind setting. Mm. So what happens? So then it, uh, it's going to choke, right? Choke. It's going to yeah. choke, right? And so you know, so that's the other extreme is, is that it'll it won't beat at all, or it won't beat for like thirty seconds or something. You know, there's really only one answer to that. There's there's either it was ground too fine, mm -hmm. which is typically the case. Or sometimes what newbies might do is they might, uh, they might dose too much, mm. you see? Mm -hmm. uh, they've seen a bunch of videos about people putting in 22 grams in a basket, and so they try and cram it in there really tight, yeah. 
-hmm. what happens is is for the grind setting that they have it's just there's just too much coffee mm -hmm. and, it, and it can't make and it can't make it through so that basically uh covers you know all the different sort of bottomless porta filter things yeah. while i'm here uh, one myth i really want to to, to to disabuse everyone of is that you know what about the puck after I remove the porta filter, mm -hmm. you know, there's I call it puckology. Mm -hmm. um, there's no value in puckology. Now, when you get the uh, when you turn off at the end of the extraction, uh, most machines have a three-way valve that releases pressure immediately. So you can imagine if the pressure goes from you know 135 psi to zero in half a second, what's going to happen to that puck? It's going to get fractured, right? I would think so, yeah. So a lot of times when people look, they say, oh, well, you know, look at that crack right yeah, there. It's water like, must have been coming through there. Yeah, right. Yeah, I yeah, gotcha. You know, if there was a terribly gross error, yeah. I mean, you know, okay, maybe you might be able to see something. Yeah. But realistically, there's not a lot of value to be derived by looking at the top of the puck. Okay. The bottom list, though, does give you a lot of insight to what's going on. So two quick questions. Okay. Number one, sometimes the puck actually sticks to the top of the right. puck. Is there anything I'm doing wrong there, or is that just something that happens? That's just something that happens. Okay. I mean, what you can do that, and you'll, you, you'll never guess what will perturb a newbie, right? And that's one of them. One yeah. of the things is, hey, you know, what's this? My puck is out the <laughs> portico, there's nothing there. Yeah. yeah, well, you know. What that happens is, is if it really bothers you, just okay. reduce the dose. Okay. What, what's happening is, is that when it depressurized, uh -huh. it sucked. It, it sucked it up, yeah. and it broke enough adhesion from the side to actually leave it behind. Okay. It's of no consequence. If okay. the espresso tastes good, perfect. Move on. It always tastes good. I just not always, yeah. but you know. Second question is I've only used a bottomless port filter. Uh -huh. And because you've you've sort of told me from the beginning just sort of what to look for, why would you not use one? Well, that, uh, that's a fair question. Um, sometimes people use it because their technique might not be spot on. Okay. And subsequently, they get channel jets. Okay. What just beep? Uh, so they get channeling. Uh huh. And subsequently, um, they don't want to get the front of their machine sprayed. Oh, okay. you know, that's kind of reason number one. I see. And then now there's a more esoteric reason. Uh -huh. Some people claim that the texture of a bottomless pour is a bit more fluffy, a little more. And you remember how we would stir espresso and kind of swirl it? Mm -hmm. That's actually to eliminate that effect. Okay.